My name is Bob, and this is my video out, and I'm happy to be here. I was born and raised in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., in a white middle class family. Uh, my father was a, uh, raised Jewish. My father was a refugee from the Nazis in Austria. Uh, family was forced to flee, came within an inch of their deaths. I was raised in a very conventional, politically conventional, socially conventional kind of family. Um, and uh, just had very mainstream thoughts. Didn't start questioning the established order um, really until I got to college. But um, there were some eye-opening moments in high school. The one speaker who came to our high school, we had a club on civic issues that I was part of, that really impressed me was about this new thing. This is 1971, I'm 16, two years after Stonewall, and there's this new thing called gay lib, gay liberation. And so they thought, you know, this is trendy, right? It's in the news, let's have a speaker come educate us. And who should it be? But someone, of course, I now know, was a very famous leader in the, in the gay freedom movement, Frank Kennedy who was the leader of the Washington, D.C. Mattachine Society. Um, and he explained, you know, it was like a one-on-one for us high school kids about, um, about uh, basic principles of uh, a positive, affirming approach towards being gay. And I kept and still have my diary from that night where I wrote, um, you know, the speaker came from, the, from a gay lib group and they don't think they're sick. And they think they're just, they're normal like everyone else. And they don't think they should be treated badly. And um, I really learned a lot. And I vow from this day forward, I won't use negative words like fag. It was a very interesting intellectual experience, but I didn't have a clue that I might be getting. That didn't even enter my head. I actually went to the Gay Students Alliance dance my first year, just as an intellectual exercise. I went with another uh, outwardly, and is still the stay straight man, and um, just to kind of see what these gay people were like. And I remember us, he and I, being impressed with how nice they were to us as people who said, well, we're not gay, we're just here to learn. I was on the rebound from a date with a woman that didn't go the way I hoped. And uh, it was late at night, and I came to his apartment and he invited me to spend the night. And I said, oh, thanks, you know, it's really nice. And then we started talking, and he decided to come out to me as a bisexual. Well, this kind of blew up my entire world. It was like, what? This man who is so successful with women is actually bisexual, and he's had sex with men? How can this be? And it just created a massive crisis in my heart. I was like, oh shit, wait a minute, what about me? You know, and I started thinking, you know, I, I kind of suppressed it, but um, one of my other best friends, I've had dreams about having sex with him, but I never really took it seriously. He was like, oh, well, dreams are weird, that doesn't mean anything. To make a long story short, he said, you know, I'm here if you want to try it. I mean, it can just be an experiment. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to mean a commitment on your part. So I put him through hell for probably two hours. Oh, I don't know. What is this going to mean? Does this mean I'm not really normal? And Oh, God, I'm not sure. And anyway, at the end of that horrific process, I said, all right, it's just, it's another kind of intellectual experience I should expose myself to. Okay, thank you, fine, let's do it. <laughs> Auspicious for a sexual experience, huh? So we did it, it was not the moon and the stars, it was sort of okay, but awkward. Anyway, by the next day, I was starting to think, wow, you know, I think, 
and kind of, kind of changing my identity as to who I am. Maybe I really am bisexual, I have to think about this. So after, after a few weeks, I pretty much consolidated that, yeah, indeed, I, I am in fact bisexual. Um, it doesn't mean I'm going to tell everyone, but... Um, and so he and I started having sex on a regular basis. And um, it took a while before I started telling a selective number of friends who were very supportive. I would be hard put to say there is a single most pressing issue affecting the queer community. Because um, I look on this at, at because I look at this on two levels. There are the queer specific issues facing us. And there I would say um, it's really as as the case as is the case for any part of the US society, it's those who are the lowest rung of society economically and socially. So in our case, that would mean young queer people, particularly young queer people of color and any kind of working class people, uh, queer people, who are, you know, who have so few economic opportunities and, um, you know, are, are often uh, um, struggling for housing and struggling for jobs uh, and then heightened by anti-gay violence and, of course, more particularly and kind of the, the, the most persecuted and the most violence is against trans people, particularly trans women of color. Um, and I think the, despite all the hype about uh, the broader society, cis, cis society's kind of alleged acceptance and welcoming of trans people, a lot of that is very superficial. But when you look at the, the murder rate of trans women of color, it's atrocious and um, there is no serious effort by law enforcement in any part of the country, even in the allegedly enlightened cities like New York or San Francisco. There's no really serious effort to get to the bottom of that. Um, and there's no, there are token programs by the government. I'm not talking about what the community has done for itself, which is remarkable. But in terms of government, taxpayer-funded programs, which every community that's struggling in any way should have, it's minimal, extremely minimal. And of course, there are large parts of the country where there's no programs at all, whether it's for trans people or LGB people, um, particularly young people. And, you know, given the suicide rates, it continue to be absolutely appalling. Um, there is no excuse for that government in action. So that's the queer specific issues. But I firmly believe that it is absolutely short sighted and you know, looking at the world through a narrow lens that um, is, I was about to say selfish, but that's not really true. It's not that it's selfish to just look at queer issues. It's that it's completely ineffective. You can't actually improve the lives of queer people who are low income, who are, you know, lacking a house or a home to live in, lacking a job. Their lives can't be improved just by addressing their persecution as a gay person. They, you also have to address their economic oppression. Their, you know, having low wage jobs, having a minimum wage that's ridiculously low, having a lack of opportunity in certain neighborhoods because of um, the, the, you know, industries that have left and no, uh, and nothing to replace it. Even though there's huge potential for a green you know, for uh, uh, renewable energy to create lots of jobs. So in other words, you have to look at the whole picture. And when you ask the question, what is the most pressing uh, issue facing the queer community? It's all of those issues about um, the structural inequities and violence and uh, kind of centering everything on profits that afflicts everything in our society. And, and let's not forget the issue of um, global climate catastrophe, which threatens all of us, queer and straight and cis alike. Um, that, you know, so, I mean, because we're part of the global community and we need to address that as well, which means essentially outlawing fossil fuel uh, consumption. So 
it's not the short answer you might have been looking for, but I think it's essential to have this broader, more holistic view of what are the problems facing us and all of our colleagues in the global community. That's a lovely question. I love the fact that I've been privileged to uh, to be part of a movement which has so many uh, brilliant and loving and passionate people, um, and that has so enriched my life. And you know, I will I will concede that I made that decision, so it's not an external uh, thing that these people found me. I did find them, and that's I'm glad I did glad I had the political foresight to realize that this is where I would not only have the best chance of improving the world, but also the best chance of happiness. I really think it's important for queer folks of whatever age to constantly be challenging the overall system they're part of, not just challenging homophobia. We have to look broader. We have to widen the lens and look at how homophobia is really a subset of sexism and that those two systems of oppression are propped up and supported by this larger structure of racism and capitalism and that um, if we don't join forces with other people who are fighting the system, we're never really going to win more than kind of modest gains. Um, and I just think we have to have this kind of broader view of the connection of issues and solidarity with other people who are fighting for their lives.